Good morning. Welcome everyone here to First Baptist. My name is Alicia Devlin. These are my sons, Jimmy. He is a sophomore at Midway High School and active in our youth group. And this is Colby. He is a second grader and loves the children's activities we have on Sunday and Wednesday nights. I also have a daughter, Rayleigh. She goes to MCC. You can find her every morning back in the nursery taking care of sweet babies back there. We wanna welcome you here today. If you have not picked up our brochure program, we wanna be sure you do that here in a couple minutes. Inside, you'll find our order of service. You'll find some announcements and our Wednesday night schedule. Guest, we are so thankful you are here with us today. On the inside, you'll find a little form to fill out. And if you'll tear that out, like Colby just did, um, you can put that in the offering plate as it comes around here in a few minutes. Or if you wanna keep it till the end of the service, we would love to have you drop it off at our welcome desk out here in the foyer. We have some members that would love to greet you in person, answer any questions you may have, and give you a little gift bag before you leave as a way to say thank you for coming. If you will now please stand and shake hands and greet those around you. Please read with me the passage found in your bulletin. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let us pray together. Lord, we are indeed here, just as the psalmist said, to humble ourselves before you and to exalt your name together, the name that is above every name, Jesus the Lord. Lord, we are here to say, to sing, to pray, but let our words not just be mere words today, but real expressions of our heart, Lord. May we say together, to God be the glory for the things he has done. We're here to pray together, take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We're here to ask you, speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth and plant it deep in us. Shape and fashion us in your likeness, Lord. These are our prayers today. May we fix our eyes on Jesus would you help us to do that in these moments together, Lord? In your name and for your glory, we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to join me down front for the children's message.
Good morning. How are y'all doing today? All right, so I brought this stool down. It's Mr. Williams' stool, so he's probably just going to have to stand for a minute. So we have Mr. Williams' stool, and he'll sit on this stool a lot of Sundays, right? If he sits on the stool, what happens? He's sitting down on the stool. Does he ever fall through the stool? Are you sure? William, have you ever sat on the stool and fallen through? No. And if you do it today, it'll be really embarrassing and ruin my children's sermon. So don't do that. Um, so, Harrison, sit on this stool for me. Harrison, how did you know that stool was going to hold you up? Yeah, it's wooden. It has a platform. The legs are not broken. You see that stool and you know, this stool's going to hold me up, right? Plus, you saw William sitting on it, and he weighs a little more than you. So, we have a stool, and we can trust that we can sit on the stool, right? Now, I have my cell phone up here. If I tell my cell phone to call Mr. Dillon, what's it going to do? How does that work? Yeah, I don't know either. I have no idea how that works. But I trust that if I call Mr. Dillon on my cell phone, it's going to call Mr. Dillon. I have no idea how it works. I can't see it, but it's done it every single time I've ever asked it to do it, right? So that's pretty cool. Another thing, person, another thing we can trust way more than we can trust this stool, way more than we can trust our cell phones to make phone calls is God. Because God has done so many wonderful things for us, we can trust that he'll keep doing those wonderful things, right? Because he sent Jesus to earth and died for our sins and he rose again. And we can trust that one day he's going to come back, right? And we learn all these stories in the Bible. We learn these stories from our Sunday school teachers. And we learn it a lot of really cool places. So next time you'd have to trust something, whether you have to trust a chair, you have to trust your cell phone, you have to trust your parents to make sure you get up in the morning. I want you to think about trusting God even more. Think we can do that? I think so. Let's pray. God, I thank you for each of these precious children um, who are here to learn about you and grow closer to you, God. I thank you for proving to us that we can trust you. Help us to find ways to trust you each and every day. In your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph, by faith Moses, by faith the people, by faith Rahab. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. Now let's read together these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God.
Let us join our hearts in prayer as we bring our tithes and offerings in an act of worship. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. In your grand design for our life, you give us the privilege of giving back to you what belongs to you. May you take these tithes and offerings and use them for your purpose, that your Son may be revealed here in our city our state, our nation, around the world. And Father, may your Holy Spirit encourage us to move beyond our tithes and offerings, to give our life in humble service so that Jesus Christ may be made known to those who do not know him. In Christ's power we pray, amen.
As we stand in this place, hear the word of the Lord from 1 Timothy chapter 6. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Let's pray together. Our good, our holy God, we are truly grateful this day for the chance you have given us to worship in this place. We thank you for your ancient words that nourish our hearts through faith in you, the true and the living God. We thank you for your spirit that moves among us to correct us, to encourage us, to shape and fashion us into the likeness of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, today in this place, as we continue to pursue the character and the heart of Christ, even as we've talked about pursuing righteousness and godliness, today, Lord, as we as we reason together, as we linger over the call from your heart to pursue faith, we pray that you speak to us in a way that our souls can hear. Lord, we come to you humbly yet boldly, and we ask you, God, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us hearts that are tender, that would receive your word like a seed planted in rich, fertile soil. Give us feet that will walk quickly to do your will. God, make our hands strong that our work in this world would be as your very own. And holy, loving God, we pray that a word of witness and life would be found on our lips. Lord, this is our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. And we pray together saying, amen, amen. amen. Please be seated, friends. Today, we are continuing the message series, Pursue. We have been looking at the call of God to flee certain things, to flee greed and unholy anger and grasping and clawing. And we've been called, admonished by Scripture, as we turn from those kinds of things to pursue things that are precious to the heart of the Lord, to, to run after, to pursue, to chase righteousness, to chase after, to pursue godliness. And today we're called to pursue, to chase after faith. Now, there are many people who talk about faith, and quite often it, it comes down to faith in faith, some type of ethereal strangeness, something that we conjure up, something unmoored and unrooted. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to pursue faith in the living God, faith in the God of promise and fulfillment, faith in the God of the Exodus and Easter and the blessed hope. We are to pursue not faith in faith, but faith in God. A few moments ago, I came to this pulpit and I read portions of that great encomium in praise to faith, which was really praise to a faithful God. In those verses of Scripture from Hebrews chapter 11, and I invite you to turn with me there. That's where most of the sermon will come from today. The opening lines, and, and remember, Hebrews is written to a group of people who are being tempted to turn their back on the uniqueness of Christ because of the pressure of persecution. And the writer of Hebrews again and again shows the beauty and the supremacy and the glory of God revealed in Christ. And when we come to 11, there is this praise to the faithful God and praise to faith in this faithful God. And it begins by linking faith with hope. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By linking faith to hope, this has helped me understand what faith is and how it operates and how we are to think about it 
and yes, even how we are to pursue it. James K.A. Smith, Jamie Smith, in an essay titled, Determine Hope, a Phenomenology of Christian Expectation. That was published in Guidepost magazine, by the way. No, it was not. I'm just joking about that. In this essay, he wrote something powerful about hope that helps me understand faith. He said, let me here note a unique characteristic of Christian hope. In Christian hope, the object and the ground are identical, even if they operate in two different modes. That is to say, God is both the object hoped for and the ground of our hope. Friends, this is an important thing for us to grasp. That God, he, he is the settled ground of our hope. And at the same time, that's which drives all of our passions. The thing most hoped for. It's the same with faith. God is the resting place of our faith. The ground of of our faith. Why, why can we live as people of faith? Because of God. Because of God's rich and abundant grace which precedes all of it. God is the ground of our faith. And God is the object of our faith. In Hebrews 11, the, the writer puts these two things together in a beautiful way, I believe, in verse 6. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, the writer said, But without faith is it impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is. He is a rewarder. He is. He rewards. He is. He rewards. Let's say it together. He is. He rewards. He is the ground and object of our faith. We must have this settled before we commit afresh to pursuing faith. Just want to spend a few moments lingering over both of them. First, God is the ground of our faith. Today in this hour of worship, we have rehearsed together the saving deeds of God. God is a God with a biography. God is a God with a story. There is a great history to God's interaction with people. God isn't a concept or the ground of all being. God is a player. And as a player, God has involved himself in the, in the grittiness that is life. God created because God is good and he gave life as a gift. And he elected his people Israel to be a light to all of humanity. And working in the story of that people, God demonstrated himself faithful again and again and again and again as he called as people responded as he made promises as he kept them as he put longings in the breast of his people as he satisfied their deep mighty desires and Hebrews 11 Hebrews 11 is a praise to that rhythm of saving deeds, of that faithful life with God. Look at some of the things that were said in this passage of Scripture. Like in 11 verse 2, it says, Our ancestors obtained their approval by faith. It said in verse 6 that God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city for them because of their faith because of their trust. 
said of all of these faithful people, some named and some unnamed, he said that all of these, they were commended for their faith. Verse 39, faith is how these men and women stood before a faithful God. And then, down in chapter 12, we have this testimony of Jesus. The author, the finisher of the faith. The longing of those men and women of old. The celebrated Savior of those who can look back on the empty tomb. The pure life. The saving death. There's this picture of Jesus in Hebrews 12 as the one who runs before, even before those he pre, was preceded by. There is this picture of Jesus as the revelation of God and as the faithful man living in true faith for our sakes before this God. The pioneer, the one on the edge of the wilderness who says, come and follow me. There is this picture of Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to convince them, to admonish them, to plead with them, not to turn their shoulder cold toward this Jesus. Not to reason that if we go back to our patterns of worship without him, we'll still have most of it all. We'll still have the fellowship and we'll still have the ethics and we'll still have the casseroles and we'll still have people to worship with and people to grieve with and people to laugh with. We'll still have the community. He says, if you turn your cold shoulder to Jesus, you may have all of those things, but what you will have is nothing For he is life. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the author. He is the finisher. And he's part of this grand story of a faithful God. He's scandalously particular. He entered this world in a moment in a body with family and an accent. He's not a notion. He is the God man who proves forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever that God is and that God is for us. You can't turn your cold shoulder to him because in him is life. He is the witness of the ground of our faith. The settled place of our surrender. Recently, I, I was privileged to stand in a great museum in front of Chagall's painting of the white crucifixion, the Pope's famous and, and favorite piece of art. Chagall painted this painting in Paris, 1938, right after the night of the, the broken glass as Hitler was rising to power as the Jews were being persecuted. Himself, a Russian Jew, he wanted to capture the moment. So he painted Jesus, very particular Jesus, not the typical loincloth of the Renaissance, but the prayer shawl of a rabbi. He was a Jewish rabbi after all. And above his head, instead of angels dancing, the men and women of the faith, the patriarchs and a matriarch of the story of God's faithfulness. And surrounding him, the scenes of contemporary persecution in life. Painting says so much, but it says at least this to me, 
that Jesus is not a notion. Jesus is the God-man who entered the world at a moment in time in the midst of sin to rob sin and to give us life. To rob our sin and to make us holy. He is the judge who would judge and say to our sinfulness, no! And the judge, judge who would come to a place, a concrete place, in a moment in time, and offer himself up a ransom for many. We can pursue faith because to steal a line from Peter McLeod, our faith has been concretized, made concrete, made concrete on a hill far away in a moment by the God man the author, the finisher of our faith. God is the ground of our faith. But God is also the object of our faith. He rewards those who diligently seek him. To please God, we must believe that he is. To please God, we must believe that he rewards, that he exists, and that he is good. The ground and the object. This is normally what we talk about when we talk about living in faith. We're normally talking about this aspect of it. God as the active rewarder. For us to have a faithful uh, concept of this, I think we have to hold two things in our mind. Oh, no. Two things in our hearts. And that's the notion of mystery and hope. Mystery and hope. Look at the words beginning in verse 32 of chapter 11. And what shall I say from the time would would fail me to tell you? Some of you say, Matt, your time is failing you too. (laughs) We'll get to. To tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mounts of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, but of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others, others, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having attained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. There's this great litany of victories. The fire stopped. The lion's mouth were shut. And then the word others. And then the word others. And following the word others was this list of those who suffered on this earth. An affirmation, a full-throated affirmation of a God who would come into the world and change things. A God that could do that and a God that does do that. And also an affirmation of suffering by people who are loved by that God and who love him in return. 
We don't want to have both of these things. We want one of them to be banished because when you hold both of these things together in your heart, there's a mystery, an amazing mystery. And we don't do well with mysteries. It served us well as modern people. It's taken us to the moon. You hear the rockets being tested. They shake your windows. But it's failed us in so many other ways. We have tried to push mystery out of our lives. There's a number of options. There's one, that old classical liberal option that just says all of that miracle stuff, that's just for those, those very simple people in earlier times. And so Jesus didn't really provide a miracle when he fed the multitudes, they just saw the miracle of the generosity and they started divvying out their sack lunches. I know people, very sophisticated people who say, sign me up for all of that. I can't handle mystery, so let's just wash it out of the Bible. And then there are more evangelical versions of, of this type of thing. There, so there's like an evangelical secessionism that says all of that stuff was fine for, for up until the time of the apostles and then all the wonders went away because they weren't needed any longer. And so God can't act that way anymore because he's decided not to. I'm glad you decide things for God like that. And then there's sort of a word of faith television version of this that just says, if you claim the right things and you say it the right way, God is morally obligated to respond because he's made a deal with you. Therefore, if you don't receive some of your, God's miracle best in your life, it's because of your, your lack of faith and trust in God. That's dumb. So here are the great options. Here are the great options, and all of them fail the test, both of Scripture and lived Christian experience. With that secessionist, op, I think it fails the test because of the scandal of wonders and miracles. I love what uh, Calvin Miller wrote about this. Calvin Miller talked about the interruption of the miraculous and how sometimes it just trips us out. He said, once a man from my church went to Oklahoma City to see a faith healer from cable television. He was delivered from his cataracts. He was healed. He came back seeing. Of course, his new sight was a terrible inconvenience to his ophthalmologist, and he would prefer to have the man call up a surgeon. And if I'm honest to myself, I guess I was a bit perturbed as well. Perhaps deep down, I too wish the man would have gone on a pilgrimage to Lourdes. Or consulted a miracle worker with a little more class. But the man had regained his sight. His miracle was one we all had to live with, televangelist or not. His wonder was one we all had to live with. God still does wonderful things, and we must contend with that. But there's another angle to that from the other side. And that's this word of faith theology that must contend with the scandal of suffering. One of the early correctives to this failure of theology was from inside and not without. From a man named Charles Farah who was teaching at Oral Roberts University. He saw the cruel taskmaster nature of bad theology and how faithful people who loved Jesus, who didn't receive the miracle that they thought they were going to get, how they were doubly brutalized by their brothers and sisters at their churches who told them that they failed yet again before God because they didn't have sufficient faith. And he wrote a, a warm-hearted, pastoral, and blistering critique of this. He said, theology always lives within the realm of mystery. He said, years ago, Karl Barth wrote about the strange new world of the Bible. Theologians often note the strangest of the men, material of resources he chooses to use. Theology is a peculiar science because when it is most true to itself, it prostates itself in humility before God in prayer and adoration. True theology is a theology of prayer, and in the presence of a living God, one adores he never totally understands. 
Any theological system that makes demands on God that are causative, that guarantees God will always act in such and such a way due to certain prayers repeated or rites performed is bound to eventual failure. It is, in fact, magic. God is God and man is man. Any theological formula that demands I always have food reckons without the Paul who went hungry. Any theological formula that demands God to always prosper me reckons without the evangelical poverty of the apostles and the early Christians. Any theology that demands God to always heals reckons with the sick Trophimus or the weakened Timothy who needed wine to strengthen a sick stomach or an aging Paul who was ill during the time he founded the church at Galatia. Friends, we live in a place where mystery is demanded because Scripture and live Christian experience demand it. We live in a world where sometimes in response to faithful prayer, God responds in extraordinary, wonderful, nearly immediate ways. And we live in a world where we must live with the mystery that my grace is sufficient for you. So how do we pursue faith in this not yet world of mystery? We do it in hope. That's what the writer of Hebrews commended them to, to live by faith, to live in hope. 11 verse 10, Abraham, he pursued a city whose architect and builder was God. The people of God in 13 to 16, they had an immigrant spirituality. They were moving toward a country, a country. And they were called to live their life on this earth with the optics of hope as they cocked their eye toward the good future that God had prepared for them. And we can pursue that country We can walk toward that city by faith. That can be the object of our faith, the object of our hope. Because the ground is sure. The one who has made promises has kept them. And there are promises yet to be fulfilled. And they are good. Oh, so good so as you pursue faith pursue faith in God and not faith in faith live in the mystery in hope asking God from your heart of hearts to do what you long for and trusting him with the totality of your life For he can be trusted. Lord, we thank you this day that you have called us to be people of faith. And Lord, the hope that we have in you is built on the life and the death and the resurrection and the witness of Christ. Today, Lord, as we Focus our heart's affection fresh on you. We pray, Lord, that as we pursue faith, that you would be glad in that. That you would take delight in our trust. That you would love us being loved by you. Lord, as we sing, we sing a hymn of surrender and commitment. Lord, for those here who perhaps need to make a public commitment, we pray, Lord, they would come today for your glory, for our good, Lord, for all of us, through the power of your Spirit, help us to renew our faith in you, the God of grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Friends, let's stand and let's sing as William leads us.
As you're being seated, I'm just led to say thanks be to God for so many, many reasons today. One reason is that God has so richly blessed us, church family, friends, with talent. Um, and with people who want to give an offering of talent, just, just look around you, just sense what happened this morning. It's, it's next to you. It's in you. That's, that's who you are. Um, today, in a special way, perhaps you notice that the front of the worship guide, the cover, is a picture that kind of guides us in our pursuit, moves us toward faith. And that picture was painted by Melanie Stokes, and it's on display in the foyer. And now the choir is grateful to offer a setting of Dr. Robert Christian that was written some time ago, a prayer that we sing today to the glory of God and to your encouragement. That's just something about the coming days, a choral benediction. <laughs> 